Okay, John, hi, how are you? It looks like we Good. are successfully going live. It's always such a nerve wracking moment there, but I have the little icon that says it worked. So Good. hello everybody, welcome. I am so excited for this. I feel like we've been preparing for this for months. <laughs> and of course you've been preparing for much longer than that. So congratulations on your, your launch of your new book. We're just so thrilled and thank you so much for for letting our shop be be part of this event. Oh, I'm excited. Thanks. I mean, I'm, I'm bummed that I can't be there in person, but this is the next best thing. Me too. Super bummed. And you know, I just keep telling everybody like when we finally do, it's going to be just this glorious extravaganza of just everybody together drinking, sharing cookies from the same plate. It will be wonderful. So um, I wanted to just quickly um, welcome everyone to Facebook, welcome everyone to the webinar. I will happily be taking questions throughout the event. So feel free to drop those um, into the comments on Facebook and also into the chat here in the webinar. And as we, as we go along, uh, I can share those questions with John. He can answer those for you. Um, we're going to open with just a quick introduction. I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. My name is Jen Mervin, and I am the owner of Pagination Bookshop here in Springfield, Missouri. Yeah. And we have been unfortunately closed to events <laughs> due to everything that's going on. Um, but we have been really, really excited about all of the amazing authors that have joined us virtually it's actually been a huge gift and i hope to continue to do these even when we can go back to in person because we can just reach such such a wider audience of people all over the country all over the globe so thank you for joining us and um i'm super excited for this because john was actually one of my professors at my uh mfa program at pacific university and what i think one of my first professors there i think you were the first workshop i was ever in um so yeah so thank you for that that was a while ago <laughs> which is like crazy because it really feels like yesterday i remember exactly like the smell of that old building at at pacific and the carpet and just our room and the handout and every i just remember it all so this is a special thrill for me um i'm going to introduce john formally to you um here with his very impressive formal formal bio, and then we'll open with a reading from John's amazing book. Um, so John McNally, who many of you know, uh, is the author or editor of 18 books, including three novels, After the Workshop, The Book of Ralph, and America's Report Card, two story collections, Troublemakers, which was the winner of the John Simmons Short Fiction Award and the Nebraska Book Award, and Ghosts of Chicago which was a Chicagoland indie bestseller and voted one of the top 20 books of 2008 by The Believer. And also two nonfiction books, The Creative Writer's Survival Guide, Advice of an Unrepentant Novelist, and Vivid and Continuous, Essays on the Craft of Fiction, which I'll just say that I have now taught, I think for five years in my classes at Missouri State. And my students absolutely love that craft book. It's fabulous. I just love it. So teachers out there, Highly recommend Vivid and Continuous. Um, now I lost my place, but I had to put in a plug for that amazing craft book. Uh, John's work has appeared in over a hundred publications, his uh, short stories and essays, The Washington Post, The Sun, San Francisco, Chron San Francisco Chronicle, Virginia Quarterly, I could go on and on. Um, he has also been a finalist for the National Magazine Award and the recipient of many fellowships. Um, so it's truly an honor to have him with us here tonight. John, thank you so much for being here. And we were talking before we went live about how you are fine, you are safe from the hurricane. So I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that your community is okay. Yeah, we we got spared, so I'm, we're grateful. I mean, not yeah. Lake, Lake Charles, not so much, but uh, Lafayette yeah. was not too bad. Good. Well, I'm so glad to see you. And um, so this is the book. I want to thank everyone who pre-ordered the book from Pagination. I was super excited to see that they sent out early. <coughs> awesome. So hopefully many of you have read the book um, by now. And if you haven't, tonight will be a perfect opener, perfect to contextualize the book as it comes in the mail if it hasn't, if you haven't received it yet. Um, 
So yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, John, to kick us off with your reading. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Jen. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Thanks everybody who's showing up too. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, I, I talked to Jen about this. I'm just gonna read the opening of, of, uh, of one story and then at the, uh, at the end of the event, I'm gonna read the opening of another story just to give you a little sampling of, of the book. Um, so the, uh, the first story is called The Magician. I'll just read the first couple of pages. In 1976, the year we were supposed to be learning the metric system, we fell in love with Katie Muldoon. We were in the sixth grade and Katie sat in front of our math class, raising her hand for every question, as though all the answers to all the problems were merely floating in front of her eyes. We loved her when she wore a poncho, which was an exotic thing to wear in Chicago. We loved her when she came to school with her long hair chopped short like figure skating, skater Dorothy Hamels. We loved her when she began crying in the middle of class one day for no reason that we could see. We loved the small scar on her forehead just above the eyebrow from the time she had fallen off the slide in third grade. And we loved how the scar turned purple after she ran the 50 yard dash in gym class. We loved her when she smiled at us and when she ignored us. It didn't matter what she wore or did, we loved her regardless. We were a pitiful lot of boys that year, the year we were supposed to learn the metric system. We rode three speed bikes and tortured bugs. We learned how to shoot milk through our noses, to peel back our eyelids and make scary faces and to create obscene noises with our hands and armpits. We had started growing hair in places we hadn't had hair before and we didn't know what to think of that. We drank Tang and our mother's tab and we laughed like hyenas. We were not by even the most generous definition of the word cool, but we didn't, we didn't know that yet, not then at least. What we did know is that Stu Bronson was cool, cooler than any of us, and far more handsome, and his blue eye with his blue eyes and dark curly hair. He was in love with Katie Muldoon too, maybe even more than we were in love Oops, I skipped a page. More uh, <coughs> than we were in love with her, and Katie loved that Stu loved her. We saw it in the way she blushed after he whispered to her, in the way she snuck glances at him during test time, and in the way she'd reach up to touch the scar on her forehead when she spoke to him, as though she were feeling it pulse and sync with her racing heart. Hey, Stu, we'd say when we caught him alone. You and Katie, we'd let it linger, our eyebrows raise. Stu would give us a look that asked, me and Katie, what? But then he'd shake his head and say, nah, okay, we'd say, because you know, and again, we'd let Stu fill in the blanks. Stu would laugh and wag that pretty head of his that we hated and then walk away. He wasn't fooling us. We knew he was lying, even if we weren't sure ourselves what we were asking, even if Stu didn't know what questions he wasn't answering. It was the year the girls were all rounded up and ushered to the gymnasium to watch a movie while us boys played air guitar and the nose harp, stopping only when the girls returned, some giggling timidly, others acting grim. They treated us diff differently from before, not better, not worse, just different. And, we, and when we demanded to be taken to the gymnasium to watch the same movie they had watched so that we could see for ourselves, we were told to sit down and be quiet. Our math class met in one of the three mobile units, a trailer that had its own coat rack and restroom. While we did our conversions from feet to, met to meters, Mr. Belansky, our teacher, would go into the restroom and smoke a cigarette. As soon as smoke began rolling out of the vent at the top of the wall, we would nudge one another and point at it, then sneak around the room, setting the wall clock five minutes ahead, or quickly jotting down answers from the teacher's edition of the textbook. The last week of October was career week, when adults would come <clears throat> during our math period and tell us what they did for a living and describe their jobs. The first guest was Stu's father, who was an insurance salesman. He arrived carrying a briefcase and wearing a rust colored suit, and we were happy that he wasn't good looking. Even though we could, we, could, we could see only the back of Katie's head, we knew that she was watching Stu's father and wondering why he wasn't handsome, and then realizing that Stu would eventually lose his good looks along with most of his hair. We asked all kinds of questions we normally wouldn't have, like, what's Stu like at home? And how much money do you collect if something terrible happens to Stu? Mr. Belansky, who had been staring down at his ruler as though mystified by the difference between inches and centimeters, Peck peeked up to give us a look that meant, go easy, boys. Our own parents, who were roofers and electricians and short order cooks, didn't come to career week. It hadn't crossed our minds to invite them. The other guests were friends of our teachers or people with whom somebody had done business, and they arrived wearing the clothes they wore at work. 
Marty Roush, a realtor, stepped inside our mobile unit classroom wearing a gold blazer with a giant gold nameplate pinned to his chest. Bernard Dunn, owner of an auto repair shop, wore crisp iron coveralls with his front name sewn onto an oval patch over his heart. We knew by how clean his clothes were that he made other people do the dirty work, and we couldn't decide whether to envy him or hate him because of that. On Thursday, when Mr. Blansky in introduced a travel agent named Martha as his wife, we gaped at one another, swiveled in our seats, his wife, until Mr. Blansky loudly cleared his throat. And we had to admit she wasn't half bad. She had a nice smile and pretty ankles. We were charmed by the way she walked around the room, occasionally touching the tops of our heads. How would you like to go to Hawaii, she asked. And how, do you know how much a passport costs? We gave Mr. Blansky sly looks that said, good job, old man, but he was too busy staring at that damn ruler again. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. Oh, thank you so much, John. I just love that opening story so much. And um, I'm glad that you started with that story because my first question was gonna be about, especially the first two stories in the book, I think are probably the most pronounced in terms of like experimentation and point of view. And I love the use of the first person plural collective. It, there's just something about that, like that group of boys, you know, this, this plural we, um, you know, and, and then all this, the abstraction and sort of generalization of that group uh, combined with the really sp specific details of, you know, their classmates, the parents, all their names. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, with that story and maybe the second story, which is really a long monologue, a long spoken monologue from one of the characters. It's the, that's the majority of, of the story. Um, I'm curious, you know, do you sort of intentionally sit down with a technique or an idea or did that voice just come to you or what is your process for that? It's, it's kind of both. I mean, I think with my early stories, my early books were mostly first person, I would say. And so, and then I began writing a lot more third person stories. My second collection has probably mostly third person stories. This book, I think just because it's, there are more fantastical stories and I'm kind of, I'm, kind of dipping my toes in different genres that I allowed myself this kind of flexibility that I normally didn't allow myself. And I love first person plural just as a voice, but I, I don't think I'd found a vehicle for it before. I hadn't really found the right uh, subject matter. And, yeah. but one of my favorite stories is by Kent Harif called Public Debts um, or Private Debts Public Holdings. And it was in one of the best American short stories. And it's a first person plural story. And what I love about first person plural is that there's a, there's a kind of culpability to the voice that you don't like at first it's you you feel the reader feels like they're kind of part of the group or they're, they're one of the, one of the characters that they're a participant, but eventually there's it, things kind of turn and become darker. And I, and I like that. I like the fact that, that you're kind of, as a reader, you're kind of hoodwinked to feel part of something that ultimately you feel kind of a little dirty feeling part of. So, so that, yeah. was, that was the appeal of that for me. The second story is an odd story. It's um, a story called The Lawyer. That The monologue is almost all verbatim a conversation I actually had with an attorney. And oh, was I was so curious about that. <laughs> and it was, and I, never, I couldn't figure out how to make it work as a story, but it was just so dark and weird. And I just I remember like leaving that meeting with him it was for us, it was for us trying to get out of a well it's a long story but it's trying trying to get out of a speeding ticket in which i wasn't speeding and when i complained about it and wrote a letter to the da's office they changed the charges and made it worse and so, so it's anyway, really coming from your real experience yeah, so that yeah. Was really, yeah and so i so i wrote the story in which the whole middle section is this monologue from the attorney and and i just thought it was i to me i thought the effectiveness just from a from a writing standpoint would be if you if you like we will know what what the narrator is thinking just because it's such a creepy monologue like we don't really yeah. need the internal thought in that point yeah and so i just thought like but then at a certain point when i was working on the story i changed genders so that it's it would be from a woman's point of view just because i think the things that he was saying is much more is, is far creepier for to be, you know, to be a woman sitting there with him listening to this conversation, than for it to be more autobiographical and have it be 
you know, kind of a, a stand in for me sitting there and listening to it. So, yeah, the creepiness totally comes through. And I love how in the spoken monologue, you have this, the suggested action, like, you know, it reminds me of like orientation by Daniel LaRoseco or some of these, you know, spoken monologue stories, you know, where there, he, he says like, are you sure you don't want any cream cheese on that bagel? You know, and you know, she's not eating, you know, she's sitting there sort of stunned by this through the suggestion of what he's saying to her. And it, it's such a, an amazing, I don't know. I just think it's such a challenging and fun voice and approach <laughs> to have a long spoken monologue. And yeah, there's just like just the right amount of sort of traditional scene leading up to that and then to close the story. Um, I want to kind of circle back to the magician because I felt like it reminded me of Stuart Dybeck's story, The Death of the Right Fielder, because uh -huh. there's this move at the end that you did that's similar to that story where we're very firmly in the moment of childhood. And then at the end, we're suddenly, out, you know, years out, they're all men. Um, but they haven't, for, you know, it's this coming of age moment. They all lost their innocence that day. And they're still kind of feeling this one foot in childhood, you know, later, years later. I loved that move. I'm curious kind of what inspired you to, to end it that way. Oh, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that I remember why I decided to make that move. I, I, I felt like, I mean, it's a story, it's one of those stories that I wrote pretty quickly, which isn't true of all the stories in the book. And so, mm. um, so I don't, it, it, it came together quickly. And it came from an idea of, it was just a news article that I read about an abduction that happened in a school mm. that, you know, that somebody had walked into the school and had taken somebody. And I just thought, and I just remembered like it's kind of the weirdness of like my own childhood in the 1970s of being in these mobile units outside the school, which, which is also just kind of a different, um, a different, I don't know, like a, something kind of surreal about that yeah. um and I had a teacher who would smoke and go into the room and smoke and so yeah. um so for me it just it felt like to get the, to get the right I, I do like stories and I can't think of some like off the top of my head because I'm terrible about doing this but I do like stories that suddenly will will if, if it works well will jump ahead in time in some way yeah and I felt like the only way to I have a, an appropriate com conclusion to that story was to do that but I can't remember yeah why I did that or what the decision was. Although I will say Dybeck has probably influenced the opening of that story because I'm a big fan of his story, We Didn't, which has oh, that I love kind we of didn't. rhythmic. Yes. Yeah, and so it has yeah. that kind of rhythm. And I think yeah. that probably was got, what got me into writing that, that whole yeah. list about, uh, about Katie Muldoon. Oh, I love that. That's such an amazing story. And that has an experimental point of view too, because it's in a stylized monologue, <clears> if I remember, yeah. This one, oh, I love it. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't, we never did. <laughs> I love that story. Um, yeah, and you mentioned, I'm, you mentioned that you're making some moves into sort of fabulism. Um, I don't know, not quite magical realism, it, just speculative and of certain stories. And I think, you know, for me, it works so well in the first story to describe that un unworldly, unnerving, surreal feeling of people disappearing, which is kind of a theme across many of the stories in the collection. But I think that probably the most kind of obvious, you know, experimental story would be the phone call. Um, so you said that this is kind of something new for you. What do you think inspired you to kind of move into this new playful kind of fabulous writing? So the phone call, there's a long history. I'm trying to figure out how to do it succinctly. So what happened was in 19, <clears throat> my mother died in 1988. In 1989, I wrote a short story called The Phone Call that was mm. really just this kind of cathartic, very, you know, had a, had a fabulous uh, element to it, which was unlike anything I was writing at that time. But it was clearly that it was, that I was kind of working through issues of grief and all of that. And, and, I, and I stayed up all night, I wrote it. And then a couple of days later, I went to go look for it and I couldn't find it. So that was like 1989. It just disappeared. Oh. <laughs> and so for years, I, I, I thought about it and I thought about, you know, what if I turned it into a novella? What if I made it into a short film? I just, I kept thinking about it, but not doing anything. And then in 2010, 2009, a friend of mine who was Ray Bradbury's biographer 
was doing a tribute anthology um, stories inspired by Ray Bradbury. And he asked me to contribute. And it had all these great people in there. I mean, there's Harlan Ellison and Margaret Atwood and Dave Eggers. And I was like, of course, you know, like nobody will know who the hell I am, but like, I will absolutely be in that book. Um, but then I thought like, I don't know, you know, I was actually kind of burnt out on writing short stories at that time. I just finished my second book. I wasn't sure exactly, you know, what to do. And then I remembered that story, the phone call. And I thought like, well, what if I try to do this from memory, you know, but again, 20 years later and try to write the story again with some remove from the inspiration of what I was, you know, working through. So I wrote it and it just, you know, it, it, it was kind of more Twilight Zone-esque, you know, which Ray Bradbury wrote for too. Um, and so it, so it had that kind of feel to it. And what it did was, and I went back and I reread some Ray Bradbury uh, books, which I read as a child. I still had check marks next to stories I liked from when I was a kid. And, um, and I just realized like it kind, of, it, it kind of reminded me of why I began writing in the first place. And I thought, oh, I just I love, you know, I love just the opportunity to be able to, to take these stories any place I want to take them and do something kind of interesting and new. So that's, um, that's, that, be, that kind of set the tone for the book. So the magician, or not the magician, the, uh, the phone call was really kind of the first story in that vein that I wrote. I did go back and pick up some older stories that I was working on and, and worked on those for the book too, but it was influenced by having written the phone call. Uh, one last thing is when I was moving then here, like 900 miles, I was packing everything up. I found the copy of the phone call, the original story that I lost in 1989, and I read it. And it was surprisingly, even though it was like very bare bones and it was, you know, I, I wasn't as good of a writer, I don't think, uh, at, at that time. But, um, but I, you know, it was interesting. The DNA was still there. And it was interesting to see the kinds of changes I'd made, but also to see how many things that were actually still had made it 20 years later from memory. That is, so, that is an amazing story. Wow. That, I mean, Th that's so surreal. I don't know. That's wild. And, and it's, like I a, it's, love... a, it's like a story of, of it really a kind of is. Story in real life. It seems <laughs> kind of perfect. I mean, and to me, like, now that you say that about that being kind of maybe at the heart of the book, that makes a lot of sense to me because one thing that struck me finishing the collection and just kind of thinking about it, it's, you know, there, there are a lot of stories that center around children and coming of age. And, you know, this, this very, either super extreme sense of loss of innocence, you know, that is, is paired with a, a violence either that happens to someone close to them or happens to them um, or someone that they know. Um, I mean, the phone call has, has a lot of violence in it. Um, the, the story, oh my goodness, the snake, um, the devil, is it the devil in the details? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, oh my gosh, that story, whoo which is so different than the other stories in a way that shocked me and in like the best way. Um, I'm curious, you know, I, I'm not reading your other books. So obviously the book of Ralph is such a great story, in, you know, about childhood um, and kids. I, I'm curious what, you know, what drives you to write about children mostly? I mean, if I think about this book, what stands out to me is how, how the, most of the characters are young. And, and even if they are adults, there's usually a heavy element of the story that, you know, the adult is sort of grappling with some kind of event from their childhood in a really central way to the plot, to the conflict that's happening. And that was a convoluted question. Why I can't? Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no I, I, I mean, I, I tell myself every book that I'm not gonna be writing about kids or I'm not gonna be writing about <laughs> young adults and I end up, it, it ends up working its way in there. So I don't, I don't yeah. you know, we may need a therapist here to help out with that, but. <laughs> Um, but I think, I mean, partly, I think like I, I had a fairly dramatic childhood. I mean, I, I, you know, we lived in a trailer in a trailer park, the trailer burned down in the middle of the night. Well, you know that from that, the essay that, uh, that Moon City published. Yes, that we published um, at Moon City, which I love that essay. Yes. Hopefully everybody <laughs> checks that out in that issue of Moon City. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just, I sort of feel like from that point on my, my childhood in which we moved around a lot, I went to five different grade schools. I just, so I think a lot about childhood just in terms of the impact it had on me and, 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 and those kinds of 
moments of, that are turning points. I mean, there's a story, the, the last story has to do with, I mean, it's the narrator is an adult and it's two adults, but, but it has to do with a missing child, a missing child, a memory of a missing child. And I just remember even as a, as a child that there was a particular child that went missing from a, uh, from a church carnival. And I just remember mm -hmm. seeing flyers around town and just being, you know, you know it happened to a, a church carnival that we'd gone to. And I just remember like, just the kind of haunting feeling I had in childhood from, from those little, from that image and then finding out what happened to him and, and just, anyways, it's just, uh, yeah. I, I, I find myself stuck on childhood in ways that I, you know, that it, it works its way, I think unconsciously into my stories, even when I'm not thinking, oh, I'm gonna write a story about childhood. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. And you know, it reminds me actually of what Deborah Gortney says, which is a totally appropriate person to quote in this. <laughs> in this interview, um, where she talks about, you know, how writers are haunted by these question marks of the soul. And often those are established in childhood, you know, especially when we're in that important transition or, you know, trauma of coming of age. You know, I wasn't Margaret Atwood that said, like, all you have to do to be a writer is survive your childhood or something like, that. <laughs> you know, something like that. Like, there's enough material in there. Um, yeah, to keep you occupied. It what I love, one of my favorite stories in the collection, and they're all my favorites in different ways, but one of one of my favorites about sort of childhood um, is the story with um, the little boy who who is the latchkey kid who mm -hmm. um, calls, you know, a grandpa. Basically, there's this service where latchkey kids can call the operator, ask for a grandpa, and be connected with someone, and you know. A nursing home or you know an elderly person who wants to connect with a younger person and and he sort of ends up with this strange man who sends him on all these journeys where the man is kind of reliving his own life through this little boy and the little boy starts to take on the personality and the voice of the older man and i just love the diction um in that story i'm curious did you have to research some of that or whose voice did you base his that old man off of i just love that story so much i wanted to steal all of his expressions <laughs> i don't know i don't I, I may have researched something but i but i you know again when i was a kid i i was often i think because i was kind of a loner i was a i was a fat little kid who rode my bike all over the place and i just i i became I was always befriended by these like older lonely guys who would be sitting out because I lived around a lot of apartments so they'd be sitting out like on their balcony with their various with a cactus plants and stuff, just like you know and they were widowed and um so they would just want to talk and you know give me a give me a cactus or whatever whatever it happens to be and um throughout my childhood I just I and they, they oftentimes they were you know, there were probably the same age differences, you know, they would have been like the age of that, 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 that older character in there. But, um, but also, yeah, I, I think that I just thought of, I had this memory recently of how, so I was a big fan of old movies when I was a kid and I was a big fan of silent movies and Laurel and Hardy. So Laurel and Hardy has this, it's like chapter, like, you know, chapters, an organization throughout the country sons of the desert and it's like and they're all different each chapter is a different name from a different movie and, and as people get together and celebrate the life of laurel and hardy and watch movies so i was excited so i i, enjoy, I joined one of those and i i had like i was probably like in sixth grade and i had my um laurel and hardy books and i had some laurel and hardy movies on super eight and I went to the library and everybody there was in their eight, they were in their eighties. <laughs> it's like, and I walk in with my stack of Laurel and Hardy books and my movies. And um, so I felt like I, uh, so in that sense, it, that's what I was trying to tap into. I think it was like this weird relationship that I had with all of these um, um, older lonely guys, you know, who were just kind of looking for some sort of connection. Well, and yeah, I mean, to me, the way that the little boy just takes on his voice and becomes this sort of suave talking, I mean, it's just kind of surreal. He even, you know, he like goes to to the thrift shop and gets the shoes that he, you know, and the hat and he's just, he's really embodying it. it I felt like it's not a fabulous story. 
in the way that the phone call is or the magician is or you know even even the story with the little girl with the snake i don't know why i want to call it the snake the devil in the details um but it feels to me like a little bit fabulous i don't know it just has that kind of wonderful surprising surreal quality to it i just i love that piece <laughs> well, the, well the first the first uh, magazine that i sent the story to rejected it and sent it back and said we just don't know what this is exactly you know we don't know is this is this supposed to be you know, like imaginary or what? So anyway, which yeah. I took as a compliment because it's like I wanted, totally. I wanted that kind of weird, surreal little yeah. feeling of this kid going on this journey. Yeah, well, I totally got it and I loved it. And I, <laughs> I think that kind of flirtation works really well, especially it's kind of embedded in the way that the book is laid out and, you know, to kind of just the, the moves that the stories make. Um, I, so you mentioned, you mentioned loneliness, like the, I mean, to me, I, I see sort of loneliness as a central conflict happening with almost all of the characters. There's kind of this deep feeling of isolation, you know, paired with kind of either something that's happening, which usually is maybe around like kind of a, a questionable romantic relationship, you know, <laughs> the varying levels of question, you know, questions going on um, or yeah, kind of like grappling with an event from childhood that, that has left a question mark on their soul in some way. Um, I'm curious when you, when you put the collection together, I'm always so curious about short story collections. You know, do you, do you pick the stories sort of consciously out of a group of stories? Are you kind of writing into a, a mood or a feeling, or do you, do you find that just kind of subconsciously happening? I'm, I'm curious about how intentional that is. It's really, it's not intentional at all. And I think that what, so each of my short story collections took 10 years to write. And so it's a very, it's a different process for me than writing a novel or writing other kinds of books that I do or writing screenplays, um, just because I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly patient with the story. And so e each book is like a snapshot of 10 years of my life. And, you know, I always talk to my students about the idea of if you're writing, you know, a first draft, you're usually writing from an unconscious state. And so you're tapping into things that you yourself don't really realize or understand. And I think with a short story collection to me, what's interesting is that by the end of the 10 years, like I may not be able to see patterns. And in fact, somebody else is the one, somebody else may have to point it out to me yeah. um, that like, oh, you have a lot of stories about loss. And I was like, oh, okay. I didn't really, I didn't realize that. I was just yeah. writing these stories over a 10 year period. But during that 10 year period, I was, I, I was getting a divorce. My father died. I was leaving a job that I had had for you know, 12 years and moving 900 miles away. So I had all of these, and those were, those were all things that were happening toward the beginning of writing of this book. And so it's, you know, I think on an unconscious level, I was just, I, you know, those were things that were just kind of, yeah, you know, uh, pervasive sorts of issues that I wasn't, I wasn't expressing to anybody. I wasn't, I wasn't yeah. walking around like a lonely person, but like, yeah. or, or, or somebody dealing with loss. But, uh, but, it, but I think it just worked its way in in kind of an interesting way. So for, for me, short stories is like they have a long enough gestation period that I'm, you know, for the time that I'm working on them, that I feel like they are little therapy sessions. I'm not writing, I'm not writing, you know, to heal myself, but, right. <laughs> but I think it's like, it's like, oh, okay, that's, so I see patterns in this particular book about what these characters are going through, which clearly I, I was also dealing with, it's just that they manifest themselves in different ways in the stories. Which to me is like the beautiful thing about art because yeah, it's not, it's not even an, an, an intentional kind of cathartic experience, but it, and that's one of the gifts that art gives us, you know, that's, and so 10 years to do the collection, I'm curious when you sit down, you know, to order them or to think about how they flow for a reader. I mean, I, to me, when I sit down to a story collection, I almost think of it like a poetry collection where I know I'm not supposed to maybe read it cover to cover <laughs> in one sitting, um, but that's often how we do read story collections. And so I think order is something that, you know, myself as a writer, you know, always thinking about a collection when I, you know, read collections or talk to other writers, um, you know, how, how do you sort of approach the ordering or the flow of one story to the next, you know, keeping in mind things like maybe subconscious themes or, you know, similar, there's kind of the bookend at the beginning of the, 
the collection with the magician. And then the final story, which also, you know, centers in a large part around a missing girl who has mysteriously been found. But then he wonders, you know, is she back? Then there's another disappearance at the end. So it's, you know, there's kind of this lost found, lost found tension that's happening. That felt intentional to me to bookend mm-hmm. the story or the collection. But I'm curious about maybe the other stories in between. Yeah, I mean, that definitely, that that was intentional. So I think like yeah. once I have the bookends, then, then so a lot of it has to do with kind of emotional pacing for me. And so that's, it's like, do I go dark here? Do I go a little lighter? And mm. do I, and also in terms of lengths of stories, so I want to yeah. go, you know, I want, I want, if I have a really short story, then that's buying myself a little time with the reader to have a longer story afterwards. Um, yeah. So it's really, it's a, it's a combination of those sorts of things. But I think I've, I've begun looking at ordering short stories as a kind of, as an emotional journey rather than, I mean, I used to have other way, I, you know, I, I used to, think about formulas, I would read about how it's like, oh, you start with your, your, your strongest story should be your first, your first story, your second strongest story should be your last story. And it's like this kind of crazy thing where it's like, if, you know, yeah. it's like, oh, so the middle, the middle story kind of sucks. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, but with this, I think it was, it, you know, there's always like one story that seems, it's like, it's hard to figure out where to put it. For me, it was the devil in the details, just because it's, yeah. a, it's a long, it's a long piece. It's historical. It's a lot yeah. different than the other stories. And I almost didn't include it because of that. I almost thought like, maybe I should write two other stories that are more contemporary, that are shorter, that just because it, it's, it's, so I probably bookended those around slightly shorter pieces, just to give yeah. it, give it some room in between. That uh, makes sense to me. I, I am so curious about that story you know, and having read a lot of your books in the past, and I know, you know, this collection, like you said, it's, it's so surprising because it's, it's a move into a young girl. It's a lot about religion, which, you know, a lot of the other stories don't really touch on as much. Um, It is longer and it's set, you know, in the late 19th century. So I'm, I'm curious, like, how did, how do you feel about that story? Did it, (laughs) <laughs> I love it. I like that you included it, but it definitely is very distinct from the other pieces. Yeah, so th- that story is, so I spent about eight years working on a long historical novel that didn't sell, oh. that didn't, that just didn't, didn't work. And, and when I set it aside, after my agent had sent it around, and then about three years later, I went and looked at it, and I could see why it didn't sell. It was that mm-hmm. I, I had gone, I had, had, I had so many different points of view, and I had so many, there's so much going on, and so many different plot threads, I'd gone a little, you know, extra on everything. And so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I went back and I looked at it. And one of the things that I had was I had a lot of backstories of characters from mm. childhood. Um, but this was the only one that I thought, and it was kind of spread out throughout the character of Mary was spread out throughout the book. And so what I did was I ended up, and I've never done this before in terms of piecing together a story from something much larger and trying to kind of Frankenstein it together and see what, what I could do. But, but what I did yeah. was I ended up uh, piecing it together. And then, it, you know, it wasn't really a complete arc at that point, but it was, it was close to an arc of a story and it was fairly long. So then I had to look and see what, what, could, I, what, what, did I, what could I cut? cut? How can I um, make it a story? Could it be a story? So that's, I just began working in a kind of, it was a, completely different creative process. But I was fine with that because it's, I felt like each story in this book was, was a slightly different creative process than what I'd done before. Yeah. Um, in some cases, some stories were, were the result of three stories um, that I couldn't get to work, but then I realized they were kind of in communication with each other. So that was a case of excising 500 plus pages of a novel <laughs> and finding this one. Wow. You know, I think it was probably about 40 pages in uh, manuscript. Yeah. So. I'm curious, you know, uh, how do you stay patient with a piece of writing like that, you know, with stories that aren't quite working, but then you eventually realize, oh, these three are speaking or this long novel needs to be this 40 page story. You know, what you said that, you know, you had kind of a different creative process. Do you, 
what do you find helps you with patience? Because I think sometimes, especially with short stories, we can get impatient with the writing. We can get impatient trying to find a place to publish it. You know, maybe it doesn't fit with other pieces. You know, what do you do with, with those, those outliers? And how, yeah, how do you kind of not let those go? It's really just, I, I mean, partly I work on so many different things. And so I, I'm constantly, it's, a, it's just this revolving door of projects that I work on something as long as it's interesting to me or as long as, it, as, long as I feel like it's making progress, I'm able to push it ahead. But once I feel like it's failing in some way or that I'm not getting to what I wanna to get to or it's not working, then I put it aside. Um, and I just assume, I, you know, I look at everything as just being this, I think partly, you know, the fact that I came back 20 years later to, to write that story, the phone call, allowed me to kind of understand that everything I write is part of something or, or the, has the potential to be a part of something later. Mm. And so, so I'm just, I'm, I'm incredibly patient with things. And there's something, there's some stories that I can't get to work that I've, I started 15 years ago. There's a story that I really wanted to put in this book and I pulled it out and I worked on it some more. I really like it. It's actually, it's a complete draft of a story, but there, I can't get the ending right. It's like, I just oh. can't get the ending right. So I put it back aside and I've thought about pulling it out again and looking at it, see if there's anything I can do with it. I keep, I keep having ideas about it. It's, there's, obviously there's something there that interests me in that story. I don't know exactly what it is, but but there's something that makes me uh, uh, return to it. On the other hand, when I go through boxes of mine and start looking at things or looking at old files, I see how many things I've abandoned over the years, which is way more than what I've actually produced. And so, yeah. um, so, so I think part of the patience, what patience allows me is that opportunity to see if something does continue to haunt me. And if, yeah. it, and if it does, then I return to it. If I keep thinking about it, I keep thinking like there's something there. The very last story in this book is one that I wrote. I probably began it in 19, uh, two, I can't remember what year this is, 2007. <laughs> I, I know, I right? <laughs> I, I probably wrote like half of it in 2007. And I liked, I liked it, but I just couldn't figure out how to push it forward. And then I pulled it back out in 2017. So I let it sit for 10 years. Yeah. And then I came back and you know, wrote the second half of it and felt like it, you know, that it, it fit together. So, but that was a story that I really, I, I was drawn to. I just, I just couldn't, I just couldn't make it work at that time. Yeah, that, well, and that might answer one of the questions that one of my students actually, John King asked in his Facebook comment was, you know, <laughs> are there any stories you've tried to write but haven't, which make you feel guilty? <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe that answers that, John. Um, do you feel an obligation to finish some stories? So maybe it's not so much an obligation, but just a a kind of like patient, a feeling of patience or generosity to to a draft. Yeah, I don't really. I, yeah, I mean, there are projects that I think about that I've that I've put aside, and I think, oh, I should go back to that. But I, I don't feel guilty about it. I, I mean, I think it's just a matter of. Do I have the time? Is this what I want to put my energies into? Is it calling to me louder than than some of the other projects that I've set aside? Like those sorts yeah. of those, those sorts of concerns or issues. And and I think there's some. And, and I, you know, there's another really long novel that I'm I I hope to finish one day. And I have an idea that I'm just going to write a hundred pages of that a year, and and maybe in ten years I'll, I'll have a draft of it. Was but that the, part of your your quarantine um, no. stack? Okay, because that was no. I was. I was telling John before before we started that he shared a photo the other day of all the pages he's written during quarantine, and it is a, an impressive stack. And it's you said the draft of two novels. It's a, a complete draft of one novel and about okay. a third of a second novel that I'm working on, and I'm hoping yeah. to have a draft of that by the end of the year. Oh, that's so exciting! Well, I want I want to pause and um, and give you an opportunity to do another reading. <laughs> Yep, so sure. yeah, we're about, we're about 15 minutes to the hour. Um, 
So uh, while John is reading, after that, if anybody would like to share a question in the comments, I of course have a million more questions, so no pressure to ask questions. But if you do have a question, um, I'll get I'll get those gathered and prepared, and we can share those with John after his reading. So I'm going to go ahead, John, and hop off and hand the screen over to you. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to read a uh, <clears throat> couple of pages from the blueprint of the brain, the blueprint of your your brain. Sorry, um, and this is the story that Jen was talking about with a. Uh, younger kid who contacts the, the grandfather, the, the Lashkey kid who, who contacts the, the older man. Uh, one month ago, Jimmy Presco accidentally burned down his parents' new garage. He was 12 years old. A pile of charred debris now sat in their driveway and you could smell what had burned and melted from several blocks away. His mother sat across from him, snipping an article from the newspaper with her toenail scissors. All the articles she saved looked like doilies because of the curved blades of the scissors. Every few minutes, Jimmy's father appeared out of the living room's bay window, pushing the lawnmower and smoking. He hadn't spoken much to Jimmy since the fire episode. Jimmy didn't blame him, really. Look at this, Jimmy's mother said, handing over one of the scallop-edged newspaper clippings. The story was about a new program for latchkey kids. If a girl or boy came home from school and started feeling lonely or frightened or sad, all she or he had to do is pick up the phone, dial zero, and say to the operator, Grandma, please. Uh, to speak to an elderly woman, or grandpa, please, to speak to an elderly man. A moment later, the child would be connected. According to the mayor who spearheaded the program, it served two goals. It provided a sense of comfort for the rudderless kids in town, and it gave meaning for, for the, to the lives of forgotten retirees who were lonely themselves and felt that their connection to society was slipping through their fingers. It's a win-win, the mayor was quoted as saying. And his mother said, pin that to the fridge, okay? When Jimmy said nothing, his mother said, remember, just pick up the phone, dial zero, and say, Grandpa, please. Jimmy stared outside where his father ran over a tennis ball that Jimmy had forgotten to pick up. The ball shot out of the lawnmower's side as though from a batting cage, a batting cage pitching machine. When the shredded ball whacked the bay window, Jimmy's mother jumped, but Jimmy didn't so much as flinch. Okay, Jimmy said to his mother, Grandpa, please. Got it. The following Saturday, for the first time since the fire, Jimmy's parents left him alone while they went shopping at Home Depot. At first, Jimmy spent time staring at his hands until he began to freak them out. It was grotesque the way each hand had sprouted fingers, and if that wasn't enough, each finger was a different length. On closer inspection, he noticed fine blonde hair up and down each finger, hair that was barely noticeable right now, but he imagined it growing thicker as he aged until both hands looked like his mother's white cashmere gloves. The thought made him queasy and sad in equal measures. Jimmy reached into his pocket and pulled out the new smartphone his parents had, had, had bought him. He pressed zero. When the operator, an elderly woman, answered, Jimmy said, Grandpa, please. Oh, the operator said, oh yes, hold on, honey. Jimmy waited patiently through a series of clicking sounds, breathing in through his nose the awful smell of the burnt garage. An old man finally came online and said, yeah, who is this? Jimmy Presco. Jimmy said, Jimmy Presco, Jimmy Presco. There was silence. Then, do I know you? Are you trying to sell me something? Because if you are, you can go to hell, Jimmy Presco. No, sir. Jimmy wanted to explain about the news article, but the, but the entire story, his reason for calling, suddenly seemed pathetic now. So all he replied was, Grandpa, please. Grandpa, the old man said. What the? Oh, wait. You're one of those whatchamacallits. Latchkey kids. The old man laughed. That's right, latchkey. Jesus, they've got a name for everything nowadays, don't they? Latchkey, for God's sake. Are you sad? He asked. Is that it? Are you lonely? He laughed. Well, boo-hoo. Jimmy said, I burned down my parents' garage. Well, now I'm impressed, the old man said. A firebug, eh? He cleared his throat. Listen, I need a favor. You think you could do something for me? As the old man explained what he wanted, Jimmy's mood lifted. He felt as though he were being pulled up out of a giant vat of molasses and hosed clean. It was, he hoped, a new beginning. Okay, I'll pause there. I love that story so much. <laughs> yeah, and someone in the chat, uh, Scott Smith, shared that Blueprint is a McNally story. I'm not sure anyone else could have written a story like this. And I, I agree. And I, I think one of my favorite moments in that story is when uh, little Jimmy calls his girlfriend Tomato. That's like his, his like, 
his like term of endearment for her. He calls her tomato, which I think, I think is hilarious. Um, yeah, we have a question um, about your process. So someone is curious as to how many hours a day you write. Oh, um, pre-pandemic, not much. Um, I mean, I would just, I really don't write much. I just write consistently. So, I, you know, I get up, I, I try to write in the morning because I try to write close to the time that I'm still sleepy. So I, because, because it's easier to kind of tap into your unconscious state during that time. Yeah. So I, you know, I, normally I would just write a couple hours a day. I spent a lot of time revising after that or doing other things or some research. But as far as the actual writing, normally a couple of hours. Um, with the pandemic, I've been spending most of the day writing because there's not much else to do. So, so I get up, um, I write, eat lunch, write some more, take a nap, get up, write some more. So that's why yeah. that explains that, that explains the giant stack of- uh, That explains the stack, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark Massaro wants to know, do you make outlines before a story or do you just let it flow? <laughs> I, yeah, I don't outline really. I just, I, I sometimes have a vague idea of a, of a movement in the story, but uh, but usually no. I mean, occasionally I have an, an idea where a story may possibly end, but I try not to be committed to that. So I just, you know, I wanna, I wanna give myself, allow myself that flexibility for the story to move in a different direction if it needs to move in that direction. You mentioned earlier that one of the stories that that you really wanted to include in the collection, but you just can't quite get the ending right. I mean, to me, I think that is the beauty of a short story. It's the beauty and the challenge of a short story because it's so short, you're constantly aware of that ending in sight. There's so much pressure on the ending, you know, in a short story. And that's the magic of short fiction to me is that that punch in the gut feeling that it gives you when you leave it, you know, it's, it's so different than what we expect from a novel or I think any other kind of, literature um you know i'm curious with your endings i mean i was just trying to notice as i read especially going through and kind of just looking at at the book um you have many different techniques with endings but a, a lot of times we end with an image that's sort of spectral and um you know the last story even talks about like like the girlfriend is sort of a specter of this missing girl that came back or vice versa um, you know, d when you think about ending a short story, do you find that maybe you're influenced by stories that you've read, writers that loom large in your mind? You mentioned that Stuart Dybeck is an influential writer to you. I wonder, like when I think of endings, I think Alice Munro, like mm -hmm. her endings are so masterful. I, it, they just leave you breathless. Um, what do endings mean for you and how do you kind of tackle that problem? <laughs> I, I mean, for myself, I do. I like I like endings when I read. As a reader, I like endings that, that have this feeling of transcendence at the end, yeah. that have a big a sense of bigness, so that it's not, um, you know, it, it it leaves you in a different emotion, like maybe an unexpected emotional space. And so, you know, a story that I read aloud to my students oftentimes is uh, Stuart Dybeck's Pet Milk. Oh, yeah. Very, yeah, which I, I just I love, love, love that story. And the very last sentence, the last paragraph, but that last sentence is just beautiful. And it's just kind of, it, it, and it moves, it has an interesting movement. It's, it echoes syntactically some things that happened early on. And so it just, and I think that just happens on this kind of weird unconscious level. But yeah. it, it, what it does for the reader is it gives that emotional lift. I think. And so and that's what I'm always trying to find. I think what I'm writing is an emo that kind of emotional lift. I love like John Cheever's Goodbye, My Brother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I also like the endings of Flannery O'Connor stories that have that kind of shock and yeah. unsettling <laughs> kind of quality. I don't know if I do that so much, but that I kind of, it's like a cringe feeling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, I, but I, I think for the most part, it is to go back to the idea of a story being an emotional journey. For me, the, the ending, I want the ending, I mean, in some ways, for example, the story, the phone call, if you were to ask me what exactly that ending means, I'm not sure I could tell you exactly what it means. I don't know, but it felt emotionally right for me. And I don't think, no one's ever questioned it. No one's ever said, like, I don't know, I don't understand that, like what that, 
what's actually literally happening. Right. Um, but it, it, I felt like it was, it was meeting at some weird crossroads that I hadn't met at in other stories I'd written. And I liked that. So, yeah. um, so, so when I get to that point, I think when I get to a certain emotional place, that's when I feel like that the ending works, mm. or works, works enough for me. And so that's, that's yeah. why I, I mean, I do like giving readings to see how things play out. Like if I give a reading and I want, you know, if I want everybody to gasp at a certain point, I'll, I'll see if they, if they, I mean, I occasionally have people walk out on readings that there's a, there's a story. I'll just say there's a dish disposal in one of my stories. And I had yeah, five, a little five shocking. People, I think five people got up and walked out last time I read that story. <laughs> I think I actually like exclaimed out loud when I got to that part. I was like, <laughs> Um, yeah, that'll be a surprise for everyone who hasn't read the book that's coming for you. This totally connects, I think, to um, a question from Anne Lee Gibson, um, who writes, do you focus on your story's main characters and allow them to tell you their story or some element of this? Um, I think, yeah, like what is kind of your relationship to your characters? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely. I mean, one thing I'll say is that a lot of my, I always have to find I had a teacher who, who asked the question, what's at stake for you and your stories? As opposed, you know, the conventional wisdom is to ask what's at stake for the main character. But, yeah. I always, but I always have to ask myself when I'm writing what's at stake for me, which means I have to find, I have to find a way into the story that's, I don't want to say necessarily autobiographical, but that there's some connection that I have that's deeper than just making something up. Yeah. You know? And um, like, I have to feel a commitment to the story on, on that level. So. I feel like every story of mine, I can like, I can probably open up to any page, point randomly at something and tell you how it connects to my life. Yeah. That said, I also, I also treat the characters like method acting in the way that I try to get as deeply inside their consciousness as possible and let it just, let it take me where it wants to take me. And occasionally it'll take me yeah. down the wrong road and I have to back up. <laughs> you know, like, I'll yeah. like oh, this is not, you know, this is just not going to go, this isn't going quite the right way. But, um, but usually if I just trust instinctually, and I think that that's, that's probably what took me the longest as a writer to develop was instinct. Mm. Like knowing if a story is heading in the right direction, knowing if it's going to work as a short story. You know, I think like for a long time, it was just very mechanical and it was just kind of working through the process or, you know, trying to, trying to write a plot quote unquote plot. And I feel like yeah. with now it's just, it's more kind of instinct. It's, it's like, you know, like some, I always, the analogy I always have is like playing pool. It's like, if you play, which I did when I was in grad school, I played pool every day. And at a certain point, everything kind of falls into place. Yeah. I mean, you may have a drinking habit, but you, but you also, <laughs> but, you, but you also can look at a pool table and say, okay, I know how to. I, the I don't muscle, have to really, yeah. The I muscle memory is there. Yeah, well, that kind of connects to uh, Ron. It had a, a great question that really connects to this. I think. How do you know when a story is ready? I, I mean, for me, it's just when I when I when there really isn't much else to do to it. When it's if I read it and then it just all I'm doing is fine tuning it, but I'm not making any kind of big changes. And yeah. and again, I think it it's just it's it becomes instinctual at a certain point. I mean, I think I've. I think I've written, I've written over a hundred stories now. And so there's, and I've been doing it for 40 years. And so it's, you know, it, if I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I feel confident in a way that I don't feel confident writing a novel because <laughs> mm. I haven't written a hundred novels. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, uh, as Shannon, Shannon Abbott just wrote, I long for the instinct and yeah, amen. Me too. <laughs> I feel so a hundred stories. <laughs> Or at least start to get there. Um, yeah, we have a couple more questions. Um, Sarah uh, in the webinar is asking about, she noticed that you included the use of a smartphone in your story. And this is something I, I get from students too. Like how do you balance, um, uh, you've just put it so well here. Do you have any difficulty in where in time you wanna place your stories? Um, I know that I agree with this question. Like I've been told by writing teachers, you want to make your stories timeless, but also that doesn't make sense because we're always in a specific moment in time when things happen. So yeah, I, I'd love to hear your response to that. 
I think I used to worry about that a little bit more, but then I also used to write more about like, you know, I mean, the book of Ralph is all set in the 1970s. And so, yeah. and, it, and it aligns when I was the age of those characters. And so, yeah. um, so I was just drawing on my own uh, autobiographical pop cultural references and those sorts of things at that time. Uh, but yeah, I think I, 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 I mean, I try, I try not to, I mean, I try not to have references that are too, that, that won't date well um, in that sense. But as far as in technology, it, it's, I think it's easier in fiction because smartphones have been around for a while. Smartphones will be for, around for a while. So it's not like watching a movie. It's not like watching, you know, the movie Wall Street where they pull out a phone and then the phone is like that big, right. you know, they're <laughs> up to their ear. So yeah. you, you don't have that visual quality. Yeah. Uh, it's it's easier to kind of get away with that but uh yeah but also i mean i don't i i, I think maybe 30 40 years ago or 30 years ago I, I may have written more in terms of thinking about how will my stories read in 50 years and now i'm thinking god will anybody <laughs> it's like you know <laughs> will anybody read the story now you know <laughs> so i'm not thinking in terms of 50 years from now um yeah. but but i do try to think in terms of at least as far as like pop cultural references trying to limit the kinds of the kinds of things I do, but I still add them. I still put certain ones in. Yeah, I, I, I love your use of popular culture. And I mean, of course I know you and you know, have been reading you for a long time and I've known you for a long time. And of course I, you know, when I get to the de details about music and musicians, <laughs> like this is not a shock to me that they're, <laughs> you know, the characters are thinking about music or it plays an important role in the story. There's lots of animals that populate the story. And like you mentioned, your passion for old films, something that really stood out to me that I absolutely love just on the level of craft and characterization in the last story is the characters constantly kind of thinking about Marilyn Monroe in these really interesting ways. And, you know, it's a very contemporary story and the, you know, the character is, is beautifully, like seamlessly including all these details uh, historically about Marilyn Monroe, not just the movie, you know, but herself, her history, details about her life. Um, do you find that you drop things you know into the story or does the story kind of lead you down the rabbit hole of, I'm gonna find out the, an interesting thing that happened to Marilyn Monroe on set. You know, I wonder what the relationship is between your research and, and your stories and your, your personal passions that kind of find their way into your work. I think it's more, I mean, I want things to be as organic as possible. So I think usually it's, it's that, you know, it's either that, that I'm dropping something in that I already know that yeah. it, it, you know, it's kind of like it, it, it comes up, it, you know, an opportunity presents itself as I'm, as I'm writing for like, oh, this would be an interesting detail. Occasionally yeah. it's not, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to remember with that last story the Marilyn Monroe stuff was added fairly late, but oh. I think what, but I'm trying to think how it happened. I think what happened was was that I was reading a detail about her, and so I wasn't researching. I wasn't going out of my way to say I need to add something in the story. I think I was researching, or I, or I was just reading something, and, and there was a detail. It might have been the detail of, I, I think this is in the story. I haven't read the story in a long time, so <laughs> but I think I think there's a detail where she's filming and her waiters. Her filming waiters, up with yeah. Water. Yeah, yeah. he's kind of sucking her underwater. Yeah. And I just thought that's a that's such a I mean it's an evocative and horrifying scary image, it is. Uh, you know, of something happening on set. And so um so I, I began so then I began thinking about other things I knew about her. And because I felt like I it, like just dropping one detail in didn't really make sense. And so I wanted to I wanted to filter in some other 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 things. But yeah. I, you know, I'm a huge movie buff, and I, and I, as a kid, yeah. I used to just read lots and lots of stuff about Marilyn Monroe and Judy Garland and all of those. And so, I love those details so much. Um, Michael Austin, at kind of circling back to characterization, um, have you ever, through the years, found that any of your characters have been drawn from a single real person? They've been inspired by real people, but usually they're inspired by a composite of people. A composite of, of uh, people. I. I mean, what's weird is so like with the Book of Ralph, which is very. I mean, it's it's set where I grew up. It's set during a time when I grew up. 
the character of Ralph in the very, very first story that I began writing about that character, which would have been in 1993, so a long time before the book actually came out, I, I, I was thinking of a very specific person, but I was actually thinking of three, three different kids I knew, mm. um, all of whom I had been friends with, all of whom were kind of, I think, viewed as, as troublemakers by uh, teachers, perhaps justifiably, but also I think that they were, you know, uh, they were nicer kids than they were being portrayed by the teachers. I mean, my teachers in yeah. the 70s were very, very, they didn't hold back on, <laughs> you know, being cruel, I guess. Um, and so, uh, so, yeah, so I think I was just thinking about that character, that kind of, that kind of kid who I think was just kind of a complex kid who wasn't necessarily the person you who who the teachers thought they were. Um, so I did in the very first story, I began thinking about three specific, very real kids, but eventually the character just became Ralph. It just became who yeah. he was. And you know, at a certain point, I wasn't really thinking about that. But when the book came out, I don't know how many emails I got from people claiming to be Ralph or claiming to be, you know, it was it was endless really, where it's like, I know exactly who you're talking about, or you're talking about my uncle. And I'm like, no, I actually I wasn't talking about your uncle. And I'm like, and they would say, Well, I know you have to say that, but you're talking about my uncle. I was like, okay. That's so funny. I wasn't talking about your uncle. <laughs> so. I love that. Yeah, that's so interesting to me because and it I mean, like thinking back on sort of, I mean, just the way that characterization works, like a lot of the the characters in this book have you know yeah a loss that is you know at kind of the ache that it's at the heart of the the weight of the stakes of the story communication is usually tricky for these characters um there might be an animal that's missing or somehow inaccessible to them, you know, that really works beautifully is I think like you can kind of move away from the relationship and onto the animal and just the metaphor works so well. Um, and I don't know, there's just something so endearing about the characters, even, even as they are falling apart or making terrible mistakes with, with the garbage dis disposal, you know, it's just, oh, it's so cringeworthy at certain points. But yeah, I just, I love the characters. And I, I think with a short story, especially, I mean, of course, there are certain stories where maybe plot, you know, is overwhelming the characters for a certain strategy. But I mean, to me, that is also the beauty of short stories is just really the sinking into this particular person in this particular moment. And that's part of the beauty of it. Um, so we have a question uh, about beginnings, which might be actually the perfect question to end with. <laughs> um, so uh, this reader asks, I think beginnings are the hardest. How do you know how, when, or where to enter a story? And do you ever write beginnings last? I don't write them last, but I, I agree that, I, I mean, I think that, I think they're incredibly difficult to do. And I, I think beginnings and endings are both incredibly difficult to do, but for me, a beginning is it's that if I'll often write a page or two and then stop and put it aside because I have to keep getting, I have to keep kind of getting deeper and deeper into the consciousness of the character. And oftentimes when I write the first couple of pages, it's, I don't really, I don't understand the character enough. I don't really, yeah. mean, or I don't, the voice isn't right. I've, I've had a lot of stories that have taken a long time because it's like, there's something off about the voice there's something off about the narrative strategy if it's if I'm writing too close to the time that the character is experiencing something as opposed to having a, a more distant reflective narration. So there are all those sorts of things that I think, I mean, when I first sit down, I don't think about any of those things. I just write the first couple of pages. But then when I go back, I have to think, I have to try to identify what's like, why does it, why doesn't it feel right? Occasionally it does feel right and I can push ahead and I know I still have to do work on the beginning, but, uh, but the times when it's taken me a long time, it's 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 because I don't. It's, there's something wrong. There's something kind of missing, or the syntax is slightly slightly off in some way, or it sounds like the last thing I wrote. <laughs> so, which is another problem. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, oh, I hate to end this. I know we're ten minutes over. I, if you're willing to indulge, there are more questions um, for me. I mean, I'm, I'm fine if people want to. I'm, I'm totally fine. I love all these answers. I'm getting, uh, yeah, and that, that speaks to me so much about beginnings. Like, I think Lynn Freed talks about how the beginning is a blueprint, and it's 
you know, the thumbprint for the rest of the story. And it's like, oh my goodness, no pressure. Cause yeah, I mean, you don't know that when you first sit down to write, you don't, you don't have all that coming back. And that's, the, that's the gift and beauty of revision, but yeah, it's also so hard. Um, Mark asked, how do you handle explaining stories to family? I always feel weird when my in-laws read my work when it comes, when it involves dark or mature elements. <laughs> uh, I, I'm trying to think, I mean, my, my mother died fairly youngish. And so I was in grad school, so she'd only read a couple of my stories. And I think, you know, <laughs> I remember she was like, it's like, your characters swear too much. Uh, <laughs> which was actually a good critique at that time. That's really, yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> There's um, not a lot of swearing in this book at all. No, and I've actually, I've cut way back on, yeah. on, on that. I think, my, I think my older stories, you know, there was more shock value, I guess, in terms of what characters would say. Um, yeah, I don't really, I, you know, I, not many, I don't, it's not really an issue for me now. I mean, I don't, there's not a lot of family members left, so it's not like I, I you know, that they read uh, the stuff that I have. So, um, but I don't, I think it was more of an issue, I think, in terms of writing the autobiography, mm. just in the sense that I don't, I don't really feel comfortable writing about people who are alive. Yeah. And so a lot of the things I, I wrote, I wait, I mean, it's not that I consciously waited to, to write, you know, after people had died, but I just, I just felt like, oh, okay, I, I, you know, th these are my mem these are my versions of of a memory where somebody else's might be different, but I, I don't want to get into like a you know a contest of like whose memory is more accurate, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, or anything like that. But yeah, I, I yeah, I think it's it, I don't really have a good answer for that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think like I I, I often write. I, one thing I will say is that I, I I've written things in the past when I was younger, especially with my first book, not really even thinking about anybody reading them. Yeah. And now, and then I, you know, it's like once the book was out and, you know, there's a, uh, maybe a few characters that may have resembled my father. And I remember my father reading those stories. He, he just had quibbles with some, some things that actually happened, but nothing big. I think he was yeah. flattered that he, that he saw himself in, in some of the stories, but that's when I, that was my first kind of why my, eye-opening experience of thinking, oh my God, people actually read this stuff. And um, yeah. so, so anyways, that was, uh, I, I think you have to just kind of make that decision on your own. Yeah, I love that answer. Yeah, it's so, it's such a complicated, weird thing about being a writer. Cause yeah, it's that sort of like revelation that people are reading it, they're reading it closely maybe making assumptions. Yeah. Um, Rachel Swearingen asks, curious if any of your characters from your short stories continue to haunt you or stay with you long after you've published the stories? Well, definitely Ralph did. I mean, the, the characters and in, in the narrator's name is Hank. And I wrote those as three, there were three short stories in my first book, Troublemakers. And then I continued writing more stories about those characters, not really thinking about it as a book. And then eventually it you know, I, I realized I had enough stuff for a whole book dedicated to those characters. And then after that book came out, I, I started writing kind of more kind of prequel-y stuff that ended up making it into a, a YA version of that book. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, but I'm, I'm kind of done with that. So I, I feel like I just, I, I had to draw the line and say no more, no more uh, <laughs> stories about them. Although who knows, you know, like maybe they'll, they'll end up Hank will move to Thailand as I hopefully will one day and, <laughs> and have his own Thailand adventures or something. I don't know. I just, but I, um, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I, that has happened. I've done that a couple of times where I've written, I've written a couple of stories about the same characters. Um, yeah. I'm, I say I'm trying not to do that, but what I'm working on now, I'm thinking of as a series. So, so I am thinking about the longevity of the characters in, in the particular book. So, which is a little different. That's, it's kind of, hoping that I'll continue to be haunted by those characters. Oh, that's so exciting. So yeah, I mean, that kind of leads to my final question, which is sort of what are you working on now? Um, you know, what could we expect to read next from you? Um, I know that you're, you're a writer that is always working on multiple projects at a time, which I really admire about you. And you, you move across genres, you write not creative nonfiction, you mentioned your screenwriting, which we didn't really get to talk about, but I know that you, you do screenplays. Um, 
yeah, I, is, is there anything coming out that we should be on the lookout for? Uh, um, <laughs> you have your eye kind of away from short story writing now and more into novel writing. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to, I mean, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, actually, I mean, I still have to sign the contract, but I'm, I'll say I'm under, I'm under contract for, for a, for a book, um, on point of view. So it'll be my, oh, that'll be my, like a, like a textbook on point of view. So, that, so there'll Great. be one more, one more book on writing. And then I think I'm done with that. And, um, otherwise I'm working on thrillers. I'm, I'm, I'm writing like a big international thriller. So cool. <laughs> I'm trying to do something that I haven't done before that's outside my comfort zone, but that I've always wanted yeah. to do because I love crime fiction. I've taught, um, I taught a course on crime fiction once, or the, uh, not creative writing, but as, uh, as literature. And yeah, so I mean, I've been reading crime fiction for decades. And, and so I just feel like I just, I want to kind of just move into something that's, I want to say completely different, although I'm sure as a, even as I'm writing and I'm like, oh, this sounds, this sounds like these are characters that could be in my short stories, but, uh, yeah. but, but just with a bigger context around them. So it's still you. Um, yeah. Which actually I lied because that's not my last question. It, you reminded me of the question that I wanted to ask you, which is, um, what are you reading right now? Is there a book that oh. <laughs> you you feel like everyone should run out and get? I mean, I'm always so curious as a reader and, you know, I'm always recommending books through my teaching and friends who want to hear it or not. And then with the, <laughs> with the bookstore, um, is there any writer that's exciting you right now or a book that's, you know, that you read recently that blew you away? Like what, what are you, what are you reading? Well, I, I mean, to be honest, and this is always, I mean, I read, I read a lot of contemporary stuff, but I, but right now I'm, I'm on this Graham Greene kick. I've just kind of gone wow. back and when I was in Thailand in the, in the last fall, I, I try to think of the book that I read, um, Our Man in Havana, I read. And I just, I just, I love the tone of it. I love the, I don't know, it was kind of doing things that I wanted to do. And I was just kind of thinking about writing these kind of bigger international books that have a, Kind of an element of intrigue to them. I mean, what I want to do is more kind of more genre -y than Graham Greene, but I just, I, so, so I went back and I just, I just finished uh, The Heart of the Matter by Graham Greene. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm just on a, I'm on a kind of weird Graham Greene kick. I mean, he wrote for so Still long. Alive. He wrote from like the, I can't, I don't know, was it the 20s until the 80s? Um, and he just has a, a wide body of work. And so yeah. I'm, I've just been going back and trying to trying to make up lost time with those right now. I love it. That just seems like perfect. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense to me. I feel like sometimes our reading leads the project or the project leads the reading. It's a very symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, we are, I'm so happy we went over. I mean, this, I usually try to be timely, but <laughs> I think this was yeah, just no, perfect. It was this was great. Fun. I, I loved it. The question just kept coming. Um, Thank you all who are who tuned in. Um, John can go back and look at all of the comments in, in the Facebook page. So <laughs> I'm sure he wasn't monitoring those as it was going on. So um, yeah, thank you so much for commenting and asking questions. Thank you for everyone who is in the webinar and asked us thoughtful questions and your thoughtful comments. So appreciate it. John, thank you so much for taking the thank time you, to do this, for being so forthcoming with your process and your life and your beautiful work and for celebrating your book launch with us in this weird time of everyone on their computers but i feel i don't know to me i still feel really connected with everyone and i just so appreciate this so thank you oh and i do i actually i do have one pitch since since rachel yeah. swearing rachel swearingen has a book coming out next month um oh. that i i picked as, a, as the uh content as, as the judge for the contest and it's um it's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful short story collection. I saw that she, you mentioned her name as having yes. asked the question. So Rachel Swearingen, write that down. That's my recommendation. Buy that book next uh, next month when it comes out. Oh, fantastic. So, okay, well, since we're all part of the Pagination family now, we'll have to make a special post for her book when it comes out next month. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah. wonderful. Well, congratulations, Rachel. Yeah, she's comment. she says thank you <laughs> in the <laughs> webinar. So that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I hope you have a great evening. We were hoping for a special, you know, cat cameo from all your adorable oh, cats who have been part of the promo, <laughs> but tell them we said hi. <laughs> I will. <laughs> thank you, John. And thank yeah, you, um, 
local local readers, uh, John very generously sent us a, a package of signed book plates. So uh, those of you that are local want to pick a cup pick up a copy of the book, um, we can you can have a signed copy, which I think is very special. And we can, of course, mail those as well. So just let me know if you want those. Uh, John very generously mailed those to us. Thank you so much again, John. And yeah, it's great to talk to you and see you and be well and stay safe. Okay, I hope to see you in person next time. Oh, yes, absolutely. We'll make that happen. Okay, thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.